Hello everybody, welcome to The Secret History, Living in Your Aquarium. I'm Alex Williamson, and I am here to tell you 10 fishy facts that I find fascinating. So, in the time that I've had this channel, and in the 35 years of living that I've done or so, I have picked up a lot of random knowledge about fish. Now, I'm also somebody who loves watching Jeopardy and trivia shows, likes doing trivia nights and things, and I have decided to compile a list of 10 of the things that I think are most fascinating that I've uncovered in hours and hours of digging through, uh, whether it's academic resources or articles in hobby publications or talking to experts, I wanted to put together 10 of the things that I think are most fascinating about this hobby. So let's jump right in at number 10 and let me tell you about the wholesale price of neon tetras. So the neon blue tetra, the most common fish in the hobby for a tropical fish. When you go deep into the Amazon where these fish live, uh, you could be the Brazilian, the Colombian, or the Venezuelan Amazon, when you're getting a neon blue or a neon green tetra, they are sold in giant bags that are collected, strained of water, and handed over for a moment, and they weigh them by how many fish are in there without water. So they will sell you a kilo of fish, live fish flopping around in a plastic bag. They'll hand it over and then they'll dump it into a, a, some sort of holding container and then head to the city. Well, the people who live in the Amazon and do this for a living are called piaberos or piaberos. And they are uh, men and women that depend on this for a living, especially uh, during certain seasons. Now, when you think of getting a big old bag of fish, one kilogram, or in American freedom units, that's 2.2 pounds or so, you're getting 1,500 to 1,800 fish in that bag. Now, how much do you guys think that would be? You know, they're five bucks a piece to, well, sometimes you get them a dollar a piece or even two for a dollar at the big box stores on sale. But how about if I tell you the true economics of it? So that kilo sells for $4.30 American for a 1,500 to 1,800 fish bag of neon tetras. Now, if we break that down, $4.30, 1,500 fish, let's be conservative, that's 0.28 cents a fish, or four fish for a penny. However, once imported over the U.S. border, the average wholesale cost in 2018 was 10 cents and uh, some change. So around 10.2 cents of fish wholesale uh, from the big distributors. So from there, they go to middlemen, and they may be anywhere from 50 cents to a dollar, and then the, from there, they'll go to the retail stores, and they'll be anywhere from uh, 99 cents to five bucks, I guess, depending on uh, where you're at these days. But the ones you get that are very inexpensive are coming from those mass shipments, and a lot of them pass away in transit, and a lot of them have been basically starved of food and just shuffled all over the place while shipping. And so it's not a, a very healthy fish generally at the big box stores. So I highly recommend that you pay the extra, you know, dollar or two and get the one that's $3.99 or $4.99 of fish and looks beautiful. It's bigger, it's healthier, doesn't have parasites. It won't get your other fish sick. Uh, but yeah, isn't that crazy that those fish are less than a quarter of a penny each in the Amazon? All right, number nine on our list. The Europeans also raised a form of koi long before the uh, carp we know today as the Asian koi or goldfish, either one, uh, which came from two different wild species of carp in Asia. As early as 900 AD or CE, Austrian monks were keeping domesticated carp 
uh, in their ponds at monasteries in Europe. And they had already written that they were well domesticated. Now, the fish kept in Europe was known as Ciprinus carpio carpio. What a Latin name, which the monks spoke at the time, too, actually. Uh, they were up to two feet long and silver uh, metallic color. And they were known as mirror carps, the ones that were domesticated. And they had these silver uh, reflective scales all down their face and their spine. And they had no scales on their side, which was extremely desirable back in the medieval times and the dark ages because it meant that you didn't have to descale these fish while serving a banquet or something. So a lot of time, uh, a lot of the times these fish were a status symbol and people would keep them in their moats and moats are sometimes where uh, wastewater and other things were thrown from the castle as well as any runoff or whatnot. And not that every castle had a moat. A lot of them had ponds or uh, actual uh, uh, fish lakes inside the, the boundary or just outside the boundary of the castle. And by 800 years ago, these fish were being kept in those ponds all across Europe. And they had different color variations, black, white, uh, yellowish, silver, gold. And they also included another fish called the leather carp, which is a variation of the mirror carp, but it has no scales on it. So there's not even the silver scales. And it was known in Britain, uh, modern day UK, and it was seen as kind of the ultimate in high status to have a carp that you didn't have to really prepare at all. And I guess it looked great on a banquet table. But that strain was kind of lost as a pet fish, even though they were kind of a thing that you would display in your gardens and so forth. And it was in 1918 that actually a Japanese man who bred koi decided to bring one of these these mirror carp from Austria from that same monastery that first wrote about them and brought it all the way back to Japan, and he bred it with the Asian carp, which is in the same genus still, actually. And that is what gives us the Doitsu carp, or Doitsu koi, as we know them now. They are actually just a cross of the wild Asian and the wild Eurasian or European carps that were domesticated, and they have the reflective metallic scales and the defined scales where you can see darkness in between the overlapping scales. I think that's pretty cool. All right, number eight on the list. In 2019, something mind-boggling occurred in a Hungarian research lab. In a 20,000-gallon aquarium holding a bunch of giant monster fish species, uh, the fish in the tank from all over the world, all of a sudden, two of them crossed and produced one of the strangest hybrids of all time the sturgeon fish. Now, the sturgeon fish is a hybrid of the American paddlefish, or polydon spathula, and the Russian sturgeon, or acipenser uh, gildenstadii, and they accidentally created this thing in 2019 and didn't tell anyone until 2020, but the tank contained all sorts of big gar and paddlefish sturgeon, uh, catfish, and it was this pool-sized tank, and all of a sudden, two of those fish from completely different continents, more than 10,000 miles apart, somehow managed to spawn together and produce live babies. Now, even more incredibly, these two fish were separated by uh, 184 million years of evolution. That's back before the dinosaurs died out. So they are in completely different taxonomic families and their native ecosystems, again, are over 10,000 miles apart. Pretty crazy that they managed to mate and create babies. Now they had over 100 babies and there are still some of them alive growing out and they are the strange alien looking fish known as the sturtle fish now. All right, coming in at number seven, there is a small species of killifish native to the American Gulf Coast. And in the swamps and bayous, it can live outside of water for months at a time. 
So if that wasn't amazing enough, this fish is also the only currently known vertebrate that can reproduce without any other mate or male or female, whatever, present. And that is the mangrove killifish or the Cryptolibius mormoratus. Uh, that's a mouthful. It's a tiny fish that lives in the shallow mangrove and cypress swamps uh, that are sometimes brackish, sometimes fresh. And when these waters dry out in the drier months of the year, summer and things, these tiny fish that only weigh 100 milligrams each, it's a tenth of a gram, uh, they can crawl out of the water up to logs, they can jump up and flop onto the banks of, of uh, the, the shore, and they will crawl inside of burrows made from other little animals, or up actual trees. They have an appendage where it's their uh, pectoral fins are able to walk up and act almost like suction cups, like a goby. And they are able to climb up these trees and then get inside of the rotten ones. And as long as the humidity is over 50%, which it almost always is down in the south where they live, uh, they are able to survive in that tree and they're able to lay eggs and by the time they come out of there they have fertile babies uh that uh, eggs that are ready to hatch this little killifish now they would prefer to mate with another fish because that allows more diversity in their uh ev evolutionary line but it looks like we know which fish will be surviving with the cockroaches when the apocalypse happens. All right, guys, coming in at number six, we've got a fish that can do something similar to the last fish. So talking about uh, biologically uh, bizarre fish and ones that are able to do things with their gender or sex, and reproduce strange ways, we have an interesting fact about domestic bettas. Now, this is one that almost nobody seems to know about other than maybe betta breeders on large scale, but uh, the common betta, known as the betta splendens, uh, your typical pet betta, has an amazing ability that it developed somewhere between 50 and 100 years ago, uh, genetically speaking, and that is that only the domestic bettas, which are actually a mix of six different betta species from the same genus in the complex betta splendens, those fish that are known as betta splendens domesticated actually had a mutation on their DMRT1 gene. And it jumped. It used to be on the X chromosome, and it jumped over to the S chromosome. It can be also be found in some fish on the Y or the T. So it can be on the S, the T, the Y, or the X chromosome. And that is what determines which sex they are, if they're male or female. And it is possible for female fish that have laid eggs successfully and spawned with other males to all of a sudden, in less than a week's time, turn into a male and fertilize another female's eggs pretty crazy. Now, the only thing that they have not documented is the fish laying eggs as a female, turning into a male, and fertilizing her own eggs. We don't know if that's uh, uh, quite the thing, but there is research going on right now. But what's more amazing about this than the fact that your betta may just up and decide to change uh, sex on you is that it means that the gene DMRT1 is completely uh, floating free of the chromosome. So where we thought X and Y were what determined male or female, it's completely free of that and it can float around on its own in fish. In the wild fish, it's still on the chromosome that it was on the whole time. Pretty interesting, huh? All right, number five on our list is a fact about the clouded archer fish, which can squirt a concentrated jet of water over six feet or two meters out of the water and up into the trees or onto the banks of river, hitting unsuspecting insects and bugs waiting, and then they fall into the water and become a meal. 
Now, perhaps the most amazing thing about this is they're able to pull it off with their eyes under the surface of the water, meaning that just their mouth is out, and they've evolved not only the ability to act like little super soakers, but they have evolved an extremely specialized ability to judge distance, water uh, pressure, and water resistance, and the angle that light refracts and warps when you're under the surface so that they have incredible accuracy with just their mouth squirting the water. Now these fish are so good at this skill that owners have reported that the pet archer fish actually squirt at cans of food uh, that are outside the tank in the fish room hoping to get an extra meal. Now one more interesting thing about these fish is that the famed author Rudyard Kipling who is the author of The Jungle Book and Ricky Ticky Tavi, if you remember those as a kid. Uh, he wrote in his diary while he was living in India and traveling on the river boats that Englishmen uh, in the colonial territory of India would grow increasingly angry as their cigars and pipes were expertly targeted and extinguished over and over by these archer fish. And they were perplexed, and so they'd keep lighting them and keep trying, and Five seconds later, they'd get put out again. And it was said that the local Indian fishermen would, uh, and sailors knew to cup their smokes, which were known as beaties, and they would cover the ember so that it couldn't be seen by the fish, and this prevented that persistent archer fish from trying to put it out. Now, why was it putting it out? Well, it turns out that fireflies are extremely common in that part of India, and that they would shoot the water jets at the uh, fireflies, and they'd fall into the water, and then they'd eat them. So they were mistaking their smoking embers for fireflies. Pretty interesting, if not maybe a little bit apocryphal. All right, coming in at number four, speaking of intelligent fish that evolved amazing abilities, let's talk about mormorids. Mormorids are a group of fish native to African rivers and lakes, and they include the elephant fish, uh, the dolphin fish, and the knife fish of various types, uh, all from Africa. Now, they're unlike any other African fish in that they are electric. Rather than having specialized uh, organs that are designed to be offensively dangerous. They have specialized organs that create charges of electricity all down the flanks of their body, and then they have sensory organs in their head that can detect electricity and electrical currents from elsewhere in the water. And for years it was not known why they had this ability or evolved this, because it's very calorie intensive and takes a lot of energy and a lot of time evolutionarily to have this very specialized skill. But only uh, as of a few years ago, they figured out that unlike electric eels that use it to stun prey and so forth and produce enough of it that it's out in the water in these concentrated bursts, mormorids or uh, the little elephant nose, Peter's eye mormorid specifically being studied, they were constantly sending signals out and you could actually put in a little headphone jack and with the right sensor, you could hear these as uh, the electrical signals as pulses and clicks and different click, 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 pop, click, 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 weird little noises. And each signal was different frequencies and lengths. And it turns out that each of those mormorid species had over 30 unique signals and pulses they could put out, meaning that in muddy waters, they, like the Nile River, they're communicating with their fellow mormorids. Now, this could be heard from easily 50 to sometimes even 100 meters away in the water, and scientists noted that they had signals for when they were feeding, when they wanted to spawn, and they were looking at the opposite, uh, you know, trying to show off for a mate. And they also said that they even had the ability to make a signal that all of a sudden silenced all the other signals from mormorids in the water for 30 seconds. And then that same fish would say something else after the 30 second pause. So it was almost like a, hey guys, be quiet, I have something important to say. And then it would say the signal. Now they're still working with linguists to try and decipher what it is they're communicating. But beyond this, they also use it as a way to sense things around them, almost like sonar. So it's a pretty amazing skill they evolved. All right, number three on our list, we're getting there to the top, is 
that there's a way you can support these deep dive videos. I tricked you guys. So, <laughs> by becoming a curator of this channel, uh, you can be a member for only a buck ninety nine a month. It gets you guys an extra ac It gets you guys extra access to all sorts of behind the scenes stuff, as well as more than one hundred and seventy five extra audio based episodes of Fishery, which is breaking news in academia and in the news related to the aquarium hobby and freshwater fish, uh, as well as all the deals and discounts I get. You guys always get first pick, and I love giving things away, so uh, you guys always get two entries to any sort of giveaway. It's only a buck ninety-nine, and it really helps my channel keep going. But if you can't do that, and you guys have made it this far into the video, totally understandable. Uh, I get it. Things are expensive. Everyone's shaking you down right now. Simply watching, giving it a thumbs up if you like my content and you think it's earned it, uh, and, and subscribing and turning the alerts on, that means the world to me, so thank you. All right, now back to the list. We're going to talk about number two, and this one, this one really surprised me. So in World War I, it turns out that goldfish were used to sense mustard gas. Now, they also use canaries and other animals too, but... Fish are incredibly sensitive to chemicals, specifically chlorine, ammonia, and, uh, and ozone. They're able to smell these, uh, these compounds and elements. They're able to smell them from anywhere between one part per million, and in some fish, one part per trillion molecules of air or water. And so they can actually smell from underwater what's going on outside the water. And they can detect, like I said, ozone, fresh water ions, ammonia, chlorine, and they can even tell which direction it's coming from. And in their fishy evolution, they'll swim away from it. So it turns out that they would put these uh, goldfish bowls in there or even pewter pots, and they'd look in, and if the fish was acting erratic or gasping at the top, they'd look at the opposite side that it was on and assume that the, the gas was drifting from that direction. Now, that's pretty interesting on its own, and, uh, you know, it, it was one of the on-the-fly things that they came up with since they didn't have any other way to detect it other than seeing it and uh, feeling its effects, the gas. Sometimes it would lay low and the wind would blow it in. So... One thing I wanted to mention tied in with this fact is that catfish have over a thousand taste buds on the outside of their skin. Now, this is almost all catfish have at least that many. Some have up to a million little uh, sensor cells, like the entire surface of their skin is a sensor cell. And they're able to find traces of moisture and drying out. Uh, if they're in a puddle that's drying out, they're able to sense where the moisture is on the horizon. And some fish can go up to half a mile or a kilometer and they can sense, oh, that's fresh water because when water's flowing or moving, it creates ions a lot of times. Also, ozone is produced during rainstorms and things, so they can sense if a rainstorm's about to begin and things like the walking carp or the snakehead, they're able to get out of their little puddle that's drying up and burrow, and a lot of them are able to enter what's called torpor and actually hide in the mud as long as they're hydrated and slow down their entire system for five to six months if need be. I think that's pretty awesome. All right, guys, so we're at number one now, and number one, the most fascinating factoid about fish that I uh, wanted to include on today's list is brand new info that was only published and discovered last year in 2022. An international team of scientists and geneticists recently discovered that we have officially domesticated several fish. Now, before this, it was thought only mammals had been domesticated and only a select few other than uh, poultry. Poultry were the exception to that. But now we know that genetically speaking, there is a gene that means that something's been domesticated. And it includes goldfish, koi, zebra danios, madaka ricefish, blue Nile tilapia, and betta splendens, probably amongst others, but those are the ones we've found so far. Now, this might not be shocking to owners of these fish that know that they have 
fascinating personalities and that they're much kinder than say a wild carp i don't know how many of you have kept a wild carp or a wild betta versus a uh, a domesticated one but the interesting thing about these fish is that they have a nerve cluster in their in their brain and when they're developing their spinal column and brain as an embryo they actually have what's called a neurocranial crest and it's a cluster of little cells and it is underdeveloped in domesticated creatures it's a very rare thing and they notice it whether it's a pig or a dog or a cat and they also notice that they're more cooperative, they'll breed in captivity, as well as they are much less aggressive. Now you may be thinking, okay, bettas, they're, they're known to be aggressive. Well, just like some dogs, like a pit bull or whatnot, they have the capacity to be more aggressive. And uh, I guess a pit bull isn't the best example in that uh, Rottweilers or uh, other, other dogs, bulldogs and things like that, they were selectively bred to be fighters or to be defense dogs and things like that. However, as a general rule, dogs are much kinder than, for instance, wolves would be or, or wild dogs. And they're much more docile. Also, they have big floppy ears and the cats also have big floppy ears compared to wild cats. And uh, those things are true. Those bigger eyes, floppy ears, and little nose that you see going on in domesticated mammals. Well, apparently they measured the faces of bettas and they found that the ratio of the smaller mouth, the big old eyes, and where their gills are rather than their ears are in a similar ratio to kittens and puppies. And this ratio is found in baby humans until the age of two also. So they think it evolved in humans as a way to endear us to our parents. And so that people would say, oh, that's cute. And the crazy twist about all this, if that isn't enough, is that humans are now found also to be domesticated. Yes, humans domesticated themselves, apparently. And that was through cooperative living together peacefully. There was a selective pressure that said it's better to be uh, domesticated or to have this trait than to not. So rather than being aggressive and rather than fighting, it's better to share resources, work together, and so forth. So we have this gene change in DMRT1, just like uh, the bettas where I mentioned that had jumped on one of our earliest facts. And it turns out that this same gene is probably because of fish that it evolved. So it was originally on the banks of the Rift Valley uh, lakes and rivers that humans first started living in larger groups. So we find individual humans uh, for hundreds of thousands, if not, you could say millions of years if you count our ancestors. But humans, modern day humans, have been around for 200 to 300,000 years, safe to say. And they didn't leave Africa really until around uh, 60,000 years ago or so when they went all the way down to Australia and uh, Asia, Polynesia, India. And then the next group came out around 40,000 years ago, went up into Europe mixed with Neanderthals, whereas the other group mixed with Denisovans. There's a whole video on that if you wanna know about it. But the crazy thing about that DMRT1 gene is that it probably developed while we were living in central to northern Africa, as well as Israel uh, and Babylonian, uh, modern day Iran, Iraq. As we we're coming out of Africa 30 to 40,000 years ago, the main migration out, we find sites with humans living in large numbers and they are fishing. Fish are what allowed them to settle down in groups of over 100 people. Before that, they have to move with the food. Now, in this time, they're probably doing agriculture and horticulture is more appropriately uh, the title of it, in that they would move and they'd plant some plants and they'd come back and visit it later. Well, this gave them an incentive to stay there full time because the water source was there full time. So it could be that fish domesticated us and then we selectively domesticated fish. Pretty crazy, huh, guys? 
If you guys like this and enjoyed it, you know what to do. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next time on The Secret History, Living in Your Aquarium.